Everyone, you know, we normally start right away, but I've heard that the traffic at the Maroon Creek Bridge is awful. So we're going to wait five more minutes. So please indulge us. Thank you. For those of you that just walked in, we're waiting a few extra minutes because of bad traffic at the Maroon Creek Bridge. Thanks. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to our 11th monthly Cloud of Witnesses presentations. After tonight, we would have been halfway through our program um, with all of the saints on the cloud around the altar and the two saints on the altar have having been adopted by one of you. But we plan on adding in the two saints on our stained glass windows on either side of the altar. Edward, the confessor, is to the left of the altar. He was one of the kings of England in the 11th century. And of course, St. Francis of Assisi is on the right side of the altar. And uh, we have some very interesting plans in mind to make St. Francis an incredible event. So stay tuned. That's about a year off. Okay, tonight, Julie Marcolunas Hall will discuss Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati and will tell you about the meal to follow of all things Piemonte. My thanks to Julie for her efforts and to Maria Liuzzi, Jeannie and John Walla, Kim Bellargian, uh, and uh, Julia DeBacker and her daughter, Greta, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone, that pitched in to help prepare our meal. And a few announcements before we start. Next month on Thursday, September 8th at 6 p.m., Mona Klinger will present on St. Teresa of Calcutta. 
Her pre presentation will be of a completely different style than anything we will have seen up to this point. You won't want to miss it, I can assure you. When we finish dinner, if all of you can give us 10 minutes towards cleanup, it will allow every one of us to, to get home quickly. And also, if any of you would like to help us on Wednesdays to prepare the meal before these events and to help set up the tables, we would be incredibly grateful. It's kind of tending to fall on the same four or five people, so we could really use more help so all these women don't feel like they have to do it every month. So just come up to me during the evening and let me know if you pitch in. And then when Julie is finished with her presentation, please remain seated because Father Derek will give us a blessing for our meal before we head downstairs. Now we will hear from Julie. Let's give her a warm round of applause. Thank you. I am so grateful to be here tonight to tell you about Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. He was a man of great joy and truly a man of the Beatitudes. And um, to put us, I, I'll just let you know that he's um, in our cloud of witnesses, just to the right of the angel's wing and just to the left of um, St. Francis of Assisi in the stained glass window. So to put us in the rights, um, in the presence of God, I'd like to um, start with the sign of the cross and a prayer of intercession for Blessed Pierre. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed Pierre Giorgio, pray for us. If you have God as the center of all your action, then you will reach the goal. Blessed Pierre Giorgio, pray for us. So today I'm going to tell you about a man who is on the road to sainthood. He truly lived his life of joy. Every time I was learning more about him, you could just feel the joy he had for life, the joy he had for serving the poor, and most of all, the joy and love he had for God. So um, that's partly what drew me to him, um, was just this, this eagerness that he had. And then also because he loved the mountains. And I, he loved climbing and hiking um, every day. And he often brought groups of people with him into the mountains. And he was falling in love with the mountains and he was falling in love with Christ. And I think that all of us here in Aspen and at St. Mary's can relate to um, that. So he said, with every day that passes, I fall more desperately in love with the mountains. I am ever more determined to climb the mountains, to scale the mighty peaks, to feel that pure joy, which can only be felt in the mountains. I also wanted to talk about him because he was very beloved by a former pastor of ours here at St. Mary's, Monsignor Michael Glenn. He was our pastor here in June, between June 1998 and June 2001, um, until he was called to be the director of vocations and eventually the rector of St. John Vianney Theological Seminary in the Archdiocese of Denver. And when he was here, um, my husband Marshall and I had the honor and the privilege to be married by um, Father Glenn. And he would often tell us, almost every time we met with him, about Blessed Pierre um, Giorgio Frassati. He loved him. He had a um, picture of him hanging on the wall, and he would often tell us stories and that he prayed um, daily for his canonization. So, um, The framed picture that Father Glenn had on the wall was given to him by a member of the Frassati family, during his studies in Italy. And like um, Blessed Pierre, Monsignor Glenn was an avid outdoorsman. And um, he himself was diagnosed with cancer in 2016 with brain cancer. And many of the, his parishioners and the priests that he loved and taught prayed um, to Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati for his healing. Um, Father Glenn loved the mountains, but he always thought that while the mountains were beautiful, 
heaven would be even better. Pier, Pier Giorgio was born on Holy Saturday in Turin, Italy, at the turn of the century. He was born to a very affluent and prestigious and very quite, uh, quite, quite wealthy family who was not at all religious. He had two sisters, one who died in infancy and then a younger sister who passed away in 2007. His father, Alfredo Frassati, was an ambassador from Italy to Germany in the period between the two world wars. And he was also the proprietor of a great newspaper called La Stampa. And La Stampa means the press, and it, it still exists today. And when you're in Rome, you can actually pick up a uh, copy of this newspaper. His father had a tremendous amount of money. Um, Al Alfredo was a self-made man. And Pierre Giorgio was um, so, and very independent and very well connected. His mother came from a family of great wealth uh, in northern Italy. She was an artist. And so Pierre grew up in, a, in very affluent surroundings. Their smallest home in Turin was 36 rooms. It was one of several homes that they had. And his father was also an atheist. He did not believe in God at all. Um, his mother went to Mass, but her children never saw her receive Holy Communion. There were no prayers in the home. Um, there was no blessings before mealtime. There were no rosaries or religious pictures on the wall. There was none of the atmosphere that you might think necessary for creating a saint. It was not a Catholic home, and yet Pier Giorgio grew up to love God. Pier Giorgio had a tutor who was a nun, and one day they were out, and the nun was taking him somewhere, and a priest was bringing communion to the home of a dying person. Now, at the turn of the century in Italy, when the priest went out, he often went out as an entourage with his altar servers and a crucifix preceding him and carrying the um, Blessed Eucharist to, to the home of the person who might be needing to receive it. And so on such a day, Pierre was out with the nun, and they saw the procession and the priest coming down the street. And the nun said, our Lord is coming. Kneel down, because he is a king. And Pierre Giorgio, who was only a very little boy at the time, said, yes, he is the king of kings. Another time on the feast of Corpus Christi, when many came to watch the procession and throw flowers, and again they were processing with the Eucharist throughout the town, and many believers and non-believers alike came out to watch, and they would throw flowers. And Pierre was watching with his family, but he had no flowers to throw. So he reached in the pocket of a relative and withdrew a pen and threw the pen into the street and said, this is for you, Jesus. He was probably about four years old at the time. So even from an early, early age, he had a sense of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. As he grew up, he started to go to daily Mass on his own early in the morning, and his parents didn't know. He would sneak out before um, dawn, go to Mass, and often spend many hours in adoration at church. He also, even in the, country, even in the countryside, he would um, try to get to Mass, and they were about three hours away from, from the nearest church, a three-hour walk, which um, Pier Giorgio, because he was such an athlete, could actually do in about 45 minutes. And it would be up over a couple of peaks and down to the next town. And so to get enough time to start and be on time for Mass, he would have the gardener tie, he tied a rope to his bedside table, and he had the gardener pull that bedside table so it would rattle and wake him up. And then he would sneak out of the house and get to Mass and then come back and often say a rosary and fall asleep um, on his knees um, saying the rosary until his father woke him up for school. Pierre was devoted to his family and the joyful companionship with his friends. Sometimes he would bring his friends to mass. He would go to the pool hall and all of his friends were there and he'd say, let's play some pool. And if you win, I'll pay you money. And if I win, you come to holy hour with me. And he won pretty often. so. People remember Pier Giorgio 
coming through town with a group of young people and they'd all be laughing and pushing each other around the way young people do. And then they would get to church and Pier Giorgio would sit, sit them all down in the pews and he would give them some rosaries and he would pass out leaflets. He always carried a lot of little things to worship um, Christ and, and devote devotions to our Blessed Mother. And then they would often fall asleep, but he would kneel up with the priests and be completely transfixed by the Holy Eucharist to the point that at one time he was so transfixed that a priest had to shake him to let him know that the hot candle wax was coming down on his back and burning his neck. He did not even notice. He was a good-looking boy, a strong athlete, a skier, a mountain climber, and a swimmer, and he was very popular. He would take trips to the mountains to ski and climb with his friends and often speak to them about Christ and God's love of the mass and God's love and the mass. And when they got to the top of the mountains, he would pull out a few psalms or say a decade of the rosary with them. He drove a car, he went to parties, but his friends said they never saw him drunk. He would drink a glass of wine, just one. They never saw him cursing. They, they said he was never party to a dirty joke. He was one of them, yet separate from them. And some of the young people didn't go to Mass, and they would say, our parents couldn't get us to go to church. The priests couldn't get us to go to church. But Pier Giorgio, he could get us to go to church. He was also a great leader in Italy of young people who were in opposition to Mussolini and the fascist movement. He led demonstrations in Turin and Rome and Milan, and tens of thousands of young people would follow him um, they, into these demonstrations to protest um, the fascists and all that was happening at, in Italy at the time politically. He was very aware of the needs of his country and because he was so engaged with youth and because he could get them to come to Mass and because he led them in these demonstrations, St. Paul, John Paul II declared him the patron of World Youth Day. And because he lived his life serving the poor, because um, he was so humble, because he stood up for, for Christ and for God, um, he was also known as the man of the Beatitudes. From his earliest years, he had a sense of the needs of the poor. Being from a rich family in a big home in Turin, people would come to the door and they would knock to see if they could get food or things that they needed. And very frequently, the staff would turn them away. And from the age of four or five, Pier Giorgio would order the staff to give them food. Or if they did get turned away, he would run after them and say, come back, come back. My father will give you a job. My mother will give you some money. When his father gave Pier Giorgio money to ride the tram to school, he would pocket the money, ride his bike or run to school, and then on his way, way home buy day-old loaves of bread and then make sure he went through all as many poor neighborhoods as he could on his way home and give the loaves of bread to the children in the streets. At the age of 18, his father bought him a car, which he sold that very day, and then he gave half of it to the St. Vincent de Paul Society, and then he gave the rest of the money to the poor. He belonged to a number of Catholic organizations that served the poor and then also um, you know, helped him develop his faith. By the time he was 21, Pier Giorgio was by himself supporting 125 families. He paid their rent, he bought their food, he bought their clothing and, and then paid tuition for their children. And then he made sure that their children received the holy sacraments. Um, he would often go to their homes um, and then encourage those families to go to Mass. And he did this all anonymously. Um, he was a famous young man. Um, and he, was known, he was very well known. And because he was a frassati, which is even today one of the three most important families in Italy, he would tell them that his name was Brother Jerome. So 
he gave out as much as he could. He did not always have all of the money himself. He would borrow it from his sister and his friends, but he kept very good accounts of the money he borrowed and the money he gave out so that he could repay others. And because of this, we know, um, we have very detailed records of how, how much he served the poor and how much money he, he gave to them. He spent his life doing it. In 1924 and 1925, Pierre Giorgio's parents were not getting along. His father was a politician and very outgoing. His mother more withdrawn and an artist and spending more of her time in her studio in the house. And they were drifting apart. And mealtime had become very difficult. There was either no speaking or there was a lot of yelling and fighting. Um, his father often threw tantrums. And they eventually announced um, to their family and to, to the community that they would divorce. And this was just crushing to um, Pierre Giorgio. He was completely um, saddened by this and stunned by it. And one day he said to his friend, I would gladly give my life if my parents would stay together. And this actually turned out to be um, somewhat prophetic because Shortly after that, on June 13th, 1925, he went climbing. And this um, beautiful picture on the right of him climbing was taken by a friend. Um, and when he saw it, Pier Giorgio saw it, he wrote on the back of it, Versa l'alto, which means towards the top. So it was, it, was his last, it was to be his last mountain climb, and it was prophetic in terms of um, you know, what was going to eventually happened with his family and his parents, but also because he was getting closer to heaven. He had um, earlier, before this climb, visited a poor person who was sick with polio. And at the time, there was no um, vaccine for polio. It, it could spread quite rapidly, and there was also no cure or treatment for it once you had it. So shortly after the climb here, Giorgio started to feel a great pain in his back and um, started to become weaker. At the same time, his grandmother died and the whole family was caught up in, the, in her wake and the funeral and they did not notice how sick he was. Um, he was staggering around the house. He collapsed three times on his way down the hall to visit his grandmother's body and he reached a point where he could barely move. When they did, re they did realize that he was as sick as he was about two days before he died. And then they went into a panic and tried to send to France for medication, but it was too late. The night before he died, he asked his sister to get his jacket and insisted on writing a note. Though he could barely move his hand or his arm, he asked in that note for medicine to be delivered to a poor man the next morning. And that was the last thing he did. Um, was to be thinking of someone else. He died very early the next day on July 4th, 1925, in a great deal of pain and agony. Ten thousand people, um, including 500 friends, came to his funeral. When they held the funeral, his parents and were stunned at how many people came to his funeral. All of the poor. 500 of his university friends, and many others. And one of his friends said, um, shortly following the funeral, we never realized he was a saint when he was with us, but the moment he died, we knew. At the time of his death, Pior Giorgio had just finished a degree in engineering. He was a layman, and he had thought about coming a pre becoming a priest because he was so drawn to God and to Christ, but his mother said, I'd rather see you dead. And then he thought about getting married, and he brought a girlfriend to his home, and his parents received her politely, but afterwards they closed the door and they immediately said, you can't marry her. She's too poor for you. And then he also thought about becoming a lay missionary, working among the Italian immigrants in the mines, which is why he got his engineering degree, because he thought he could go to Germany or America and work among the poorest of the poor. But his father said, 
No son of mine is going to dirty himself working with the poor. You will work in the newspaper. So while Pierre Giorgio was thwarted in some of the things that he aspired to do, he lived his life, and though he hadn't found a, a, his life's vocation, his life really became, his serving the poor and serving God really became his vocation. And that didn't deter him not, not becoming a priest, not getting married, not finding a career, did not deter him from doing um, so much with his young life. And I think sometimes many people young people wait to see what they're going to do with their life before they start living their life. And um, he really found his purpose in life and lived his life with great joy from very, very early on. And that life was serving the poor and loving God. So as I had mentioned earlier, his parents were so stunned by the number of people at his funeral that they stayed together and ended up converting their lives and then began to work together for the canonization of their son. So they reconciled. And so his wish, you know, to give his life so that his parents would, would stay together actually was, you know, his prayer was actually granted. They did stay together. Five years after Pierre Giorgio's death, which is the normal length of time that passes before canonization can be considered, um, they were starting to gather all the paperwork and interviews and things that were necessary to consider. And his name had been put forward by many of the poor in Italy at, um, for canonization, as well as for his family. Um, Mussolini stopped that can those canonization proceedings. He put pressure on the priests and the bishops and the cardinals in the church because the Frassati family had been opposed to the fa fascists. And so then he also took away the, the Frasati's home and he sold their newspaper out from under them to another family for, for pennies. Um, he also spread rumors that Pierre Giorgio was not such a good and holy boy, that he was having affairs, that he did not actually die, that his parents had buried him alive because they were so embarrassed that he was becoming a cripple. And so nothing was done on the cause for his canonization for a number of years. So Pope Paul VI, when he was a young priest, became a chaplain of the youth group that Pier Giorgio had belonged to. And so when he became Pope, he ordered the cause to be open. And again, the cause means all the paperwork and interviews and investigation to a holy person's life when they are put forward for canonization. So for seven or eight years, he was waiting for the cause to be completed by the bishops and the and cardinals that he'd put in charge of it. And then later discovered, even seven and eight years later, he discovered that still the cause had been delayed by bishops and cardinals, that they had still been given into the influence of the Italian political system. And so he became quite angry about that and said, bring me the paperwork, I will open the cause myself. When St. Pope John Paul II became Pope, he was also, as many of you know, a mountain climber and a skier. And as a young boy, he had read about Pier Giorgio in a mountain climbing magazine, and he fell in love with Pier Giorgio. And so he completed the cause and beatified Pier Giorgio. Um, as part of that process, Pier Giorgio's remains were exhumed in 1981, and that was 56 years after his death, and they were found to be completely intact. This is a picture of them in um, 1981, and they, he still had very clear eyes, very elastic skin, and then, of course, the Italians were very excited about it, so they took him on tour <laughs> around the many cities. Um, but it, part of that being perfectly incorrupt also signified that he had truly gone to heaven and should be canonized. Um, so here's a picture of Pope John Paul II coming to pray in 1989, less than one year before the beatification ceremony. So P Blessed Pier Giorgio was beatified in his own ceremony um, on May 20th, 1990. Um, oftentimes when saints are beatified or canonized, there's a ceremony um, which can be quite costly, um, and there's a mass, 
and so often the church will beatify more than or canonize more than one saint at a time. And in this case, St. Pope John Paul II insisted that Blessed Pierre have his own ceremony and said he would be beatified um, with just his, uh, in his own ceremony because he had become holy without the help and support of his family and without the help and support of priests or a seminary and with his own response to God. And that he did so quietly and he did it anonymously and yet he touched thousands of lives and he poured out his heart to everyone. So he also then received the title of Man of the Beatitudes. Once a cause for canonization is open to beatified, to, for a, a holy person to be beatified or canonized, there's an expectation of miracles to indicate that that holy person has indeed gone to heaven. And in Pierre Giorgio's case, there was a miracle shortly after he died. A man was dying and he was very much an atheist and had been all his life didn't believe, and when he was dying, his wife said, please let me get you a priest so you can be reconciled before you die. The doctor had predicted that he would be dead before morning, and the man said, no, I do not want to see a priest. I never want to see a priest, and so his wife, who, who, was, who did believe in Christ, had a holy card with a little piece of a bed sheet from Pierre Giorgio's deathbed, and she said, well, at least let me lay this on you, this holy card, and, and, and say a prayer. So he conceded to that, and she put the card on the man, and he immediately was healed. He jumped up and went down the, to the church, banged on the priest's door, and asked to receive reconciliation. And so that is considered the first miracle and the miracle for beatification. And so now we are waiting and praying for one more miracle to, um, to be confirmed so that um, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frasati will become um, a saint. And so it's been a, um, a great pleasure to share his life with you and um, a little bit about this man who came to believe, um, was drawn to Christ and followed that calling and um, did so in, in the mountains and with a great love of, of, of the mountains and of people and of the poor and of God. So thank you. And so now I get to tell you a little bit about our dinner tonight, which is also full of joy and a lot of hard work and blessing by all the people who prepared it. And I want to say a special thank you to Anne O'Brien. It's really incredible to see how much she puts into this, these evenings. So I'm really touched by that. So. Okay, so our dinner tonight is going to showcase the cuisine from Piemonte, the Piemonte region of Italy, the home of Blessed Pierre Giorgio. So when you first go downstairs, please be seated. And um, this is going to be a little different than in the past. Um, we're not going to go straight to the table um, to serve ourselves. We're going to go downstairs and find a plate of antipasti awaiting us at the tables. And that antipasti plate will consist of grana pardano cheese, similar to par parmigiano, castelmagno cheese, braciola, which is a dried cured meat, prosciutto, and grissini breadsticks. And when we are ready to serve you, we will call you to the buffet. Both tables have the identical food, and you can go down both sides of the table to expedite serving. Dinner includes very typical dishes of the region, vitello tonato, thinly sliced veal, served chilled with a tuna sauce that has tuna, cooked egg yolks, olive oil, capers, and lemon. It may sound a little unusual, but it is outstanding. And then we also have risotto with asparagus and sage and fresh tomatoes from our farmer's market. And finally, hazelnuts. Hazelnuts, they are ubiquitous ubiquitous in the Piemonte region. So dessert will include imported Piemonte hazelnut torts, bachi chocolates, bachi de mama cookies from the region, Piemonte Gian, do you, oh, help me with, 
Dion D-O-E-T chocolates, Dioto chocolates, um, by, by a Ochi shortbread cookies. And on the self-serve bar, bar, we have Peroni beer and a few wines from the Piemonte region, a white Arnais, which translates to little rascal, two reds, a Barolo and a Barbaresco, both made from the Nebbiolo grape from Piemonte. So thank you so much for participating tonight and bon appetito. And Father, before we go, would you please give us a blessing? Thank you, Julie. That was an amazing presentation on Pier Giorgio. Um, does anybody have any questions for Julie or me, I guess, about this wonderful saint? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, she asked when they brought him out of the grave, when they exhumed him, she wanted to know if he had been embalmed or what kind of casket he had that might have preserved his body so well. Um, I don't know the answer to that question other than that I think it was really seen as a sign that he had been taken up to, to God, that, that, his, that God did not let his body be touched by um, corruption or decay. And so I think that's happened with other saints as well. Yeah. So... Yeah, Brenda, just um, when you go home, Google incorruptibles. It's amazing. There's lots of saints out there who've been dead for centuries, and their bodies are incorrupt. And they're on display in cathedrals and basilicas, you know, in Italy, around the world. It's, it's amazing. It's how God proves that this is real. <laughs> this heaven is real. Becoming a saint is real. Um, the question is, was it determined what he died of? He did die of polio. He did die of polio. And a very advanced case, a very rapid case. So, in, And it created great pain it was because it affects your nerves, and he was in terrible pain. So. Oh, I don't know. Oh, um, hmm. I do know the answer to this. I want to say that his parents died in the, um, I know his dad died in the early 1960s, and um, I think his mother died a little bit earlier than that, and his sister didn't die until 2007. So they worked for quite a number of years. I don't think they actually got to see him um, be atified, um, his parents didn't, but his sister did. So it took quite a long time to dispel all those rumors to really, and it really took the efforts of two great popes, two saints, um, to, to undo the damage that Mussolini had done by cre creating those doubts. So both are on our cloud of witnesses, mm -hmm. Paul VI and JP2. You know what? Two things I, that struck me, Julie. Um, one thing you said about Pierre was uh, when he was in college, he would challenge people to pool, right? Is that mm -hmm. pool? And if he beat mm -hmm. them, they, they came to Mass or they came yeah, to adoration. The holy hour. Yeah, yeah. holy hour. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to evangelize, huh? <laughs> and, um, and the other thing is I loved how you brought in um, the personal aspect with um, our beloved Monsignor Michael Glenn. Mm -hmm former pastor here, and his incredible love and devotion to Blessed Pierre Giorgio. And I can assure you, when he came down to the seminary in Denver, I was there while he was rector, he brought that love and devotion for Pierre Giorgio mm -hmm. to the formation of priest and archdiocese. And I mean, he would talk about Blessed Pierre often and preach about him and, mm -hmm. and, and use, his use his witness as examples of how to be holy, become holy priests. And now it's just dawning on me because, uh, you know, we have college, uh, Catholic college campuses up in CU Boulder and, and CSU Fort Collins. And oftentimes the Archdiocese, you know, assigns um, seminarians there for the summer who have the spirit of blessed Pierre Giorgio and young priests that go through there, of course, because they got to minister to the young population. And I've heard all kinds of stories of priests and seminarians 
challenging kids to <laughs> to pool <laughs> any type of games, any type of wagers. And if those they win, you're coming to mass tomorrow, right? And if not, the priest will pay up too. But <laughs> um, it's just an amazing way to evangelize. I can just see the spirit of Pier, blessed Pierre Giorgio, you know, through Monsignor Michael Glenn, through the formation of priests, and just spreading around the world like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so if any of you, you don't want to make bets with people, that if you win, get them to come to Mass. <laughs> That's a good way to evangelize <laughs> anything you're good at. <laughs> if your favorite team wins in sports, say, oh, you got to come to Mass. Yeah, that's a good um, way to do it. <laughs> okay, should we uh, pray and go downstairs for this lovely meal? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless you and we we thank you for so great a cloud of witnesses who surround us now in our journey here on earth as we we, um, walk this pilgrimage to join all the saints in heaven where we are destined to be. Lord, we thank you for our life, our faith, our church, all of our friends and families. And Lord, we raise up all our prayers and petitions to you to be answered according to your holy will through the intercessions of the saints, and especially this evening when we learn and honor Blessed Pior Giorgio Frassati. And Lord, bless our food this evening. Bless the amazing and wonderful hands that prepared it. And may we have just a wonderful evening together, um, enjoying our faith and giving glory to you, O Lord. And let's pray together. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again, Julie. Thank you. 